good Wednesday evening to you or whatever day you happen to be watching this. It's Wednesday for me. I'm glad to have you join with me again for our midweek pastor's Bible study. We will continue for the foreseeable future doing these midweek Bible studies uh, through the internet so you can watch uh, online whether you're doing it through Facebook Live or for, through our church website. Uh, we are meeting on Sunday mornings. We will continue to meet on Sunday mornings. We're working on a plan going forward that will uh, allow small groups to meet, the connect groups to meet again. That's still yet to come. We'll be making announcements about that. But uh, Wednesday nights for the foreseeable future, we will not be meeting in person. We'll be doing it this way. And so I invite you to continue to take part in what we're doing uh, every Wednesday night. As you know, right now we are involved in a character study of the kings and prophets that you find in the books of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Now, those six books contain much of the same material, just from a different perspective. And so, rather than going through each of the books and repeating a lot of the same material over and over, I've just picked out uh, fourteen key individuals that we're going to study over these three months. Uh, as we kind of get an overview. It's not a verse-by-verse verse in these six books, but it's an overview of the information that's given there. And I believe that if we can get a good grasp on these individuals, that we'll understand the material, uh, the, the historical background, and all the things that are being given to us in these passages of Scripture. When we finish those, in, uh, after the three months is concluded, we will move on in our journey through the Old Testament. That will put us in the book of Ezra. And we'll just continue right on in our study. So thank you for joining tonight. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. We'll turn into God's word. Father, thank you again tonight for the opportunity to gather. We continue to pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. We've got an election in a few months that's very important. I pray that you would uh, give us wisdom as we make decisions, uh, whether it's at the local level, the state level, the national level. Uh, we need men and women who have a heart for God, who have an understanding of uh, truth, and I pray, Lord, that you would guide us in uh, the decisions that will be, will be made in coming months. I pray right now as scientists, experts continue to work for a solution to the uh, coronavirus issue that has really uh, changed life for all of us. I pray that you would uh, guide their thoughts and decisions they're making and that uh, very soon we would have a remedy for this uh, particular issue. Lord, we continue to ask for your blessings around us. I continue to pray for revival, for a great awakening, for a spiritual awakening. And I pray, Lord, that it would be in me, begin in me. If you do a work in me, uh, perhaps that will change the world around me. And I pray that that would be true for every person listening right now, that we would all say that simple prayer, Lord, send a revival, a great awakening, and let it begin in my heart and my life. Now, I pray that you'd be with us as we open your word tonight and illumine it for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we started this study last week in 1 Samuel, and uh, the first individual that we looked at was Samuel himself, for whom the books of 1 and 2 Samuel are obviously uh, named. Samuel was, the some would say, the last of the judges. Some would say the first of the prophets, and I believe both of those would be correct. He was a judge, but he was also a prophet, and God used him in an incredible way. Now, uh, Samuel was not a king. I've, I've called this a, a character study of kings and prophets. He was not a king, but he was a king maker. God was going to use him to anoint uh, the first kings of the, of the uh, Hebrew people, the nation of Israel. So tonight, we're going to look at the first of those kings. His name was Saul. Now, you probably know his story very well, but I'm going to give you an overview of it tonight. Now, we could really, he's a fascinating person, and we could spend weeks really studying the life of Saul and some very uh, in-depth, uh, detailed information about his life. Uh, but rather than doing that, tonight I'm going to give you an overview. My hope is that when we finish this study tonight, in the next 30 minutes or so, that you'll have a grasp on some, some parts of Saul's life that would help you to understand as you go into God's Word, as you read something about Saul, that you'll have an understanding from an overview of his life that would help you to, to have a grasp on, on the truth of God's Word that comes out of whatever passage you happen to be studying. 
So tonight we're going to look at Saul's life, and I'm, I'm going to kind of put it into four um, components, four stages of his life that I think summarize uh, what happened in him and how God could have used him, and, and Saul just did not allow those things to happen. Now, this is found in Scripture in 1 Samuel. It would be between chapter 9 all the way to the end of the book, which would be the 31st chapter. Now, obviously, we're not going to read all of that tonight, but I am going to read from several passages, some rather lengthy passages that I'm going to refer to. And it's always easiest if you have God's Word in front of you, rather than just listening to someone read, if you're reading along with them, it's always easier to keep your focus and to pay attention and not get kind of lost in what's being said. I think it also helps us to concentrate more. When we not only hear God's Word, but we're seeing God's Word, it helps us to, to, to glean a little bit more out of that. So there are four stages of Saul's life that I really want you to focus on with me tonight. The first one would be the beginning of his life. And I would say to you that he had a delightful beginning. His life started in a way with great opportunity. Like many people, God had put his hand upon Saul, and he had such great potential and such great opportunity. Now, before I jump into the ninth chapter, let me just remind you that in chapter 8, Samuel had, it had been demanded of him by the people of Israel that he give them a king. They wanted a king. They said, then we'll be like everybody else. That's always a problem when we try to be like everybody else, because the fact is, that God made us as his people to be different. That's why the New Testament says that we are a peculiar people. Peculiar doesn't mean strange or weird, but it means different. We are different because we are children of the King. We are different because we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to just try to be like everybody else is not what God wants us to be. But in the 8th chapter, they said, we want to be like everybody else. And, and I, I mentioned last week that... Samuel warned them what that would mean. If you give a king autocratic control over you, he will be able to take your servants, he will be able to take your fields, he will be able to take the fruit of your fields, he will be able to take your money, he will be able to take your grain, he will be able to take your, your, your land, he can take anything he wants if you make him king. But they continued to demand, this is in chapter 8, in the, in the 20th verse, no, we must have a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. Our, kings will, our king will judge us, go out before us, and fight our battles. And the Lord told Samuel, give them a king. So that's what he does. Now, in chapter 9, we see this beginning in the life of Saul. The first verse says that there was an influential man of Benjamin. That's the tribe of Benjamin. His name was Kish. Verse 2 says that he had a son named Saul. An impressive young man. There was no one more impressive among the Israelites than he. He stood a head taller than everyone else. Now, th th this is a big, strapping, good-looking young man. He's the kind of guy, he was a head taller than everybody else. He would have played center on the high school basketball team. He would have been the quarterback of the football team. This is a guy that everybody wanted to be like. This is a guy that everybody looked up to. He was, he was strong. He was good looking. He had a physical uh, stature that caused him to stand above everyone else. He had a great opportunity before him. Here is a young man who had a wonderful beginning in his life with many opportunities. Now, there's an interesting thing that happens here right in the beginning. Look at verse 3, chapter 9, verse 3. One day the donkeys of Saul's father, Kish, wandered off. Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the attendants with you and go look for the donkeys. Saul and his attendant went through the hill country of Ephraim and then through the region of Shalishah, but they did not find them. They went through the region of uh, Shalem, nothing. Then they went through the Benjamite region, but still didn't find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to the attendant who was with him, Come on, let's go back, or my father will stop worrying about the donkeys and start worrying about us. Well, he, he knew uh, his father very well. That's the way parents are. We would do that. Verse 6, Look, the attendant said, There's a man of God in this city who is highly respected. Everything he says is sure to come true. Now, it's interesting to me that the attendant knew about the man of God. 
The servant knew about the man of God, but Saul, the son of this important influential man, the, the, the one who was over the servant, Saul didn't know anything about this man of God, but the servant did. Now, that's a small thing, but it's a hint, maybe of something of the character of Saul's life. Verse 7, let's go there now. Maybe he will tell us which way we should go. Suppose we do go, Saul said to his attendant. What do we take to the man? The food from our packs is gone. There's no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? The attendant answered Saul, here, I have a piece of silver. I'll give it to the man of God, and he will tell us our way. Now, that's interesting to me, too, that the attendant had something that the son did not have. Maybe the son was... Uh, wasteful. Maybe he didn't know how to save. The attendant had this piece of silver when Saul himself had nothing. Uh, that's a small thing, but it's kind of interesting to me. So you go down on through the passage. Uh, you continue to read there. Uh, they go to the man. Uh, you look down in verse 12. They've asked some women, where is this man of God? Uh, she said, yes, he's ahead of you. He's come to the city to make a sacrifice. You can catch up to him if you go there now. Skip down to verse 15. Now, the day before Saul's arrival, the Lord had informed Samuel. Now, Samuel is this man of God that they're looking for. They're wanting him to tell them where the donkeys are. That's what they're looking for, donkeys. Now, the Lord had informed Samuel at this time tomorrow, this is verse 16, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will save them from the hand of the Philistines because I have seen the affliction of my people for their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man I told you about. He will rule over my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gate area. He said, would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel answered. Go up ahead of me to the high place and eat with me today. When I send you off in the morning, I'll tell you everything that's in your heart. As for the donkeys that wandered away from you three days ago, don't worry about them. They've been found. So <clears throat> this is Saul's first encounter with Samuel. God has told Samuel, Saul is the man that you will anoint as king. Samuel sees Saul, sees his stature, sees his countenance sees that he is a head taller than everyone around him and he must think this is an incredible person that God has chosen so the start of Saul's life the opportunity that's before him is great now look on down to verse uh, chapter 10 look down in verse 9 first Samuel chapter 10 verse 9 when Saul turned around to leave Samuel this is the next day God changed his heart and all the signs came about that day. When Saul and his attendant arrived at Gibeah, a group of prophets met him. Then the Spirit of God took control of him, and he prophesied along with them. So God is doing something in Saul's life. I mean, think about it. He went out looking for donkeys. He's just out looking for his father's donkeys. And in the process of that, the man of God says, you are going to be the king of Israel. And he has begun to prophesy. God, at this moment, has his hand upon him. And the opportunities that are out there for Saul are limitless. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things about Saul. And you have to know a little bit about what's going to happen later in his life to appreciate this right now. I'll mention what's going to happen in a moment. But just notice kind of the character of Saul's life at this moment. This is still in chapter 10. Look down in verse uh, 17 and the verses that follow there. Uh, Samuel summoned the people to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the Israelites, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel out of Egypt. I rescued you from the power of the Egyptians and the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you've rejected your God who saves you from all your troubles and afflictions. You've said you must set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by tribes and clans. So they go through a process. All of the different tribes come through. Uh, it's narrowed down to one. All of the different clans come through. It's narrowed down to one. All of the different families come through. It's narrowed down to one. And finally, it comes down to Saul. And Saul is the person that Samuel has chosen to be king. Look down in verse 22. They inquired of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? The Lord replied, there he is, hiding among the supplies. Now, 
Here's the point that I want you to get in this. We're going to see in Saul later in his life an arrogance, and we're going to see a a deceitfulness, and we're going to see a bitterness and an anger, a hostility that comes out in him. But early in his life, there is a real sense of humility, sensitivity. He's hiding. He's been chosen by God. He already knows he's been chosen by God. Samuel has told him that. He already knew before this, this... all happened all of this coming by by tribes and clans and families he already knew that he was the one upon whom the the cloak was going to be placed he knew that he was God's chosen one and yet they found him hiding uh, among the supplies because of his sense of humility that he's just not sure how he's going to be able to do this now early in his life that's the character that you see in him let me show you one other thing that gives you a little bit of a hint of his character look at the very end of the 10th chapter uh, down in verse 26 and 27 now now Saul has been named king everyone's been told he's going to be the king verse 26 Saul also went to his home in Gabeah and brave men whose hearts God had touched went with him but some wicked men said how can this guy save us They despised him and did not bring him a gift, but Saul said nothing. Saul said nothing. Now, that doesn't sound like the Saul that we know from later in Scripture. Saul would have had a fit. Saul would have blown a gasket. Saul would have called for someone's head to be taken off. But early in his life, he was sensitive. He was humble. He was not vindictive at all when these people said these mean, untrue unfair things about him when they were not willing to give him a chance he was not vindictive at all so his here's the point his life began with a delightful beginning a wonderful opportunity that God had given him to do something special in his life but let's fast forward a little bit now I don't I, I don't have time tonight to go into great detail about all of this but the delightful beginning turned into a disastrous failure And there were several times in his life that God gave Saul an opportunity to do the right thing and to do the good thing and to do God's thing, and he just failed. Now, let me point out just a couple. There are many. We could go in great depth on all of these. But look in the 13th chapter. Uh, Saul is being given a test by Samuel. Samuel has told Saul what he wants him to do. Let's pick up the story in verse 6, chapter 13, verse 6. The men of Israel saw that they were in trouble because the troops were in a difficult situation. They hid in caves, thickets, among rocks, and in holes and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul, however, was still at Gilgal, and all his troops were gripped with fear. He waited seven days for the appointed time that Samuel had set. See, Samuel had given him some instructions, and Samuel is testing him. He waited the appointed days that Samuel had set, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the troops were deserting him. Verse 9, so Saul said. Here's the beginning of the problem, a disastrous failure for Saul. So Saul said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offering. And then he offered the burnt offerings. Now, in the Old Testament, there were three key uh, positions. There was prophet, priest, and king. Now, interestingly, Jesus fulfilled all of those when God sent his son to be our savior. He is prophet, he is our high priest, and he is the king of kings and lord of lords. But in the Old Testament, those three positions could not be intermixed. And one could not do the duties of the others. There was separation between those three things. And Saul's position was king. It was Samuel who was the prophet. The, the priest who was to make this offering. But Saul took that responsibility on himself. Now look at verse 10. This is how we know it was a test. Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. So Saul went out to greet him, and Samuel said, What have you done? Now that's not the word you want to hear from the Lord. What have you done? Samuel had given Saul a test, Saul had failed the test. Rather than trusting the Lord, rather than doing what the Lord through Samuel had told him to do, Saul has taken it on himself. Look at what he does in the, in the next part of that verse. Saul answered, when I saw the troops were deserting me and you didn't come with the appointed days, 
I thought the Philistines will now descend on me at Gilgal, and I haven't sought the Lord's favor. So I forced myself to offer the burnt offerings. You, you hear what he's doing there? He's blaming Samuel. Now, I didn't want to do this. I, I waited and waited and waited, and you didn't show up. And when you, it's your fault. You didn't show up when you, you ever say that to the Lord? <laughs> Lord, this is all your fault. You aren't showing up. You didn't show up. I, I asked you to, to, to fix this problem. I asked you to be there for me. And you just, you just didn't do it. Lord, this is your fault. That's, that's what Saul is saying to Samuel. It's your fault. I, I was forced to take this on myself. I didn't want to do this thing. And what you see there is the beginning of a lifetime of failure for Saul. That's really where it all started. And you can, you can go down through the 14th chapter. You see it in there. Uh, as a matter of fact, look in chapter 14 down. Oh, verse 23, 24, along in there. There's a story there of Saul making a very rash oath. His men are at war. They're in a battle. And they're getting tired. They're weary. You can read the story there. They're, they're getting weary. They're worn out. They need rest and they need food. And, food. and so, Saul is so... Uh, unfair to his men, he says, if any of you eat. Now, th you would think that he would be smart enough to know that they need to eat and they need to rest. And if they're going to win the battle, they have to be strong. But he took just the opposite. He said, if any of you stops to rest, if any of you stops to eat, that person will be put to death. Now, you go on and read that story. His own son, Jonathan, did not hear that edict. He didn't know that his father had swore that oath. And Jonathan and his band of soldiers were going through an area of the wilderness and he saw a honeycomb. And the passage says that he took his spear and he, he dipped it into the honeycomb and he ate the honey to give him the energy from that sugar and that honey. And it, it renewed his energy. But the problem was his dear old dad had made that rash oath, anyone who eats will be put to death. Well, word got back. You look down in the 43rd verse, 44th verse. Tell me what you did. Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of the staff that I was carrying. I'm ready to die. Saul declared, may God punish me severely if you do not die. He, he, he swears an oath against his own son. He had a great beginning, a delightful beginning, but he's having disastrous failures, and it just gets worse. If you look on over in the 15th chapter, let me just kind of sum this part up. Look down in, in, in verse 11 of the 15th chapter. This is, this is the word of the Lord that came to Samuel. This is God speaking. I regret that I made Saul king, for he has turned away from following me and has not carried out my instructions. He had a delightful beginning. But you see, every opportunity that we have doesn't always end in a good conclusion. And a lot of us have good opportunities chances and we blow it he had a great beginning a delightful beginning but a disastrous failure that happened in his life now I want you to see what happened as a result of his failures he became a deep-seated bitter jealous person now if you look a little bit further over beginning in chapter Oh, you could start this really at the end of chapter 15, but really in chapter 16 and 17 and 18, all along in there, David comes on the scene. Now, I'm not going to take time tonight to talk about David because he's one of the individuals that we're going to be studying in the next week, and I'll talk about David then. But for right now, let me just say that David entered the picture, and Saul, who has now failed in God's plan, and God has already said, I regret that I made him king, and there's going to be another king. David comes on the scene, and Saul just becomes a bitter, jealous old man. I don't want to be a bitter and a jealous person. I don't want to go through life that way. God gives us all opportunities. God has a purpose and a plan for all of us. And Saul had so many opportunities in his life of what could be, but he, he just became bitter and jealous. You know the story in the 17th chapter of David fighting Goliath. We'll talk about that later. He defeats Goliath in the 18th chapter. When David comes back, the people are singing his praises. 
They're talking about all that he has done. Here's the song that they were singing. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Chapter 18, verse 8 says, Saul was furious. He resented this song. They credited tens of thousands to David, he complained, but they only credited me with thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. How do you react when somebody else gets the credit? When somebody else gets the promotion at work, somebody else gets the bonus, the boss calls somebody else's name instead of your name, how do you react when someone else gets the credit? See, Saul had great opportunities in his life. God God gave him a great beginning. God gave him great opportunity, but he failed because he did not obey God. Now, all of us have opportunities, but if we do not obey God... There is that danger that we become bitter and jealous and angry. You look at his life, and he just, he, one old term that people used to use was he just became manic depressive. One day he was sky high, and one day he was at the depths of despair. You remember the story. One day he wanted to kill David. The next day he hugged him and kissed him and told him how much he loved him and the next day he wanted to kill him again it was just up and down it was that bipolar personality and it all happened because not because he didn't have opportunity he did he had great opportunity we have great opportunity it happened because he failed at obeying God and when he failed at obeying God the result of that was bitterness and jealousy and anger and hostility and all of those things we'll flip over to chapter 28 let's get over toward the end of it and, and every, every chapter that I'm passing by right now is, is about Saul and his life. And a lot of it in pursuing David and the hatred and the jealousy that he had in his life. Now, let's get over to the end. I, I want you to see the disappointing end of his life. And, and, and consider what could have been. What might have been. This is the disappointing end to his life. You, you get over to the 28th chapter. Now, chapter 28 is a very strange chapter. It's one of the most unusual chapters in the Bible. And I, and I, can't, <laughs> I can't explain it. All I can do is tell you what it says. Saul, uh, Samuel's dead. And, and Saul is desperate. He's looking for a word from the Lord. And he doesn't know where else to go. So he goes to a witch, the witch of Endor. He disguises himself. And he, he, he gets the witch to conjure up. And again, I can't explain this. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The witch conjures up the spirit of Samuel. And Samuel appears to Saul and said, why why are you bothering me? What do you want? And Saul says, I'm in trouble. I'm in serious trouble. Look at verse 15. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up, Samuel asked Saul. I'm in serious trouble, replied Saul. The Philistines are fighting against me. God's turned away from me. He doesn't answer me anymore, either through prophets or in dreams. What am I going to do? That's what he's saying. What am I going to do? And Samuel says, well, let let me tell you, Saul, this time tomorrow, I'm paraphrasing, you can read it. This time tomorrow, you and your sons are going to be where I am. In other words, you're going to be dead. You've come to the end of the journey. If you skip on over to chapter 31, you find the end of the story. Verse 3, chapter 31, verse 3, when the battle intensified against Saul, the archers caught up with him and severely wounded him. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through with it, or these uncircumcised men will come and run me through and torture me. But his armor bearer would not do it because he was terrified. Then Saul took his sword and fell on it. He killed himself. When his armor bearer saw Saul was dead, he also fell on his own sword and he died with him. So on that day, Saul died together with his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men. What began with such promise ended in total disaster and disgrace. Now, how can we keep our lives? What's the kind of takeaway from this? How can we keep our lives from ending this way? Number one, obey God. (laughs) Obey God. That's where Saul failed. He did not obey God. He did not do what he was supposed to do. A second kind of truth that comes from Saul's life, I mean, as you just read through this, that is don't let power and authority go to your head. Whether that's in a family, whether that's in a business, whether that's in a church, 
whether that's in government, don't let power and authority go to your head. You've heard the old saying that power corrupts and absolute power absolutely corrupts. That's exactly what happened with Saul. He just got so full of himself. When he could have been full of God, and had he been full of God, everything would have turned out different. He had every opportunity. He just miserably failed. The lesson is, lead the people to the Lord. Because to lead people to the Lord, we have to be going to the Lord ourselves. Saul had great opportunity. A delightful beginning. A disastrous failure because he did not obey the Lord. A deep-seated jealousy that just began to rule his life. And a disappointing end to a life that might have been. I don't want to live my life that way. I don't want to hear those words from the Lord. What have you done? What have you done? God help us to be faithful with the opportunities that he's given us. To stay in a spirit of humility and sensitivity. With no vindictiveness in us. So that at the end of the journey, rather than hearing him say, what have you done? We will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thanks for joining me tonight. Hope you've enjoyed a little journey through the end of 1 Samuel as we've looked at the life of Saul. We'll take a third individual next week as we continue to study together. Let me pray. Thank you for joining me. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be here tonight to study your word. And I pray that every person here has at least captured some glimpse of how we can live life better according to your plan. Lord, may we take every opportunity that, we, that you give us and may we take full advantage of it and be everything that we can be through the power of Jesus. I pray that in his name. Amen. Hope to see you Sunday. God bless you.